Joe Orth and I are starting a podcast. What should we call it? Mm. Hey, don't pick on me. You know why? Because this is why. Well, let's see what he says. The Joe Show. <laughs> Give Joe the business. That's right. <laughs> Top of Joe. <laughs> Top of Joe. What is happening here? Would you listen? We'll give you a chance. Thank you. Uh... <laughs> That's Joe. <laughs> That's Rooster. And this is the Together We Shall podcast, episode 21. What is uh, going on in your world? I'm going to go see a band that I wouldn't say is like my version of your Counting Crows, but I'm super pumped to head to Charlotte tomorrow to see the old Red Hot Chili Peppers. So when did you very first time you ever heard of the Red Hot Chili Peppers? Like, take us back to the to sometime Man. under a bridge or something. <laughs> In middle school, for sure. And then I remember, like, just CDs, you know, Discmans. I had, I had the yellow one um that was like the anti-shock <laughs> uh so walking around the neighborhood with that thing i think i still have californication for sure of the compact disc in the closet um but yeah i mean you're talking 20 plus years right 25 years of digging their music uh so i'm pumped to to see them Are they coming to wilmington or what were you charlotte bank of america stadium home of the yeah. panthers keep pounding you that's the same place you saw Garth. So that'll be an interesting comparison. Garth to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Hmm. What I was confused about, too, when I bought the tickets for Garth for my mom and I, I was like, man, these are pretty cheap. And we got good club level seats right near uh, the stairs, exit aisle, quick access to the bathroom, the bar. And then when I went to get Chili Peppers, like, we're, we're we don't have great seats, but they were more. I paid more for worse seats than I did for Garth. I don't, I don't know. Is it because yeah. Garth had two shows Friday, Saturday? Yeah, I don't know, man. That's weird. I, yeah, no impact, but I'm sure you'll figure it out as soon as you get there. Or maybe there was more seats available and it's a supply and demand thing, but I don't want to get in all that. So uh, it's going to, it's going to be great anyway. <laughs> what are you up to? Oh, I just finished doing a whole bunch of Spotlight Saturday uh, archives review. So I got old videos. And you remember from PJ's episode 19, he said, we're bringing Spotlight back. And so by the time folks are listening to this, they should have seen episode 216. But anyway, I was looking at Spotlight Saturday episode uh, or Spotlight Saturday footage. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that never made final cut. So it's just sitting in an archive folder. It was like a walk down memory lane of stuff that like probably has never been seen by anybody except now me and the person that that took the footage like that kind of uh, it's cool stuff. But anyway, I'm stoked bringing spotlight back. It's going to be cool. Um, but anyway, today's guests, we got two of them. That's fun. I like this trend together. We shall podcast having multiple guests on one. Uh, but in this case, we have uh well, you know what? I'm going to let them introduce themselves. How about that? So, without further ado, hello, friends. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, y'all have to tell us, who are you, where are you, and why are you two on the Together We Shall podcast? Uh, I'm Owens. What's your name? The best thing. Well, where are we from? Texas. Where in Texas? Houston. Houston, Texas. We're greater Houston. Uh, and I'm Gary Elmore. I'm his mother. And we're here to tell y'all all about us and how we got involved with... Angelina. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was solid. <laughs> yeah, good intro. Y'all practice that. <laughs> no, but the thing was, I <laughs> said no practice required. Actually, <laughs> okay, fair, fair, man. I'll take that, Sebastian. That's cool. But I know there's a lot of ways we like to jump into these episodes, kind of like to kind of get some history, some chronological background. You know, how did we get to this point? So I don't know, Gary. You want to tell us a little bit about your story and. Uh, I don't know, back in the day? Okay, I can start back in the day. Okay, so I am now, and I say it because I don't care, I am 51 years old, and I had Sebastian when I was 30. So um, he is my miracle baby. 
Um, he was born two pounds, 14 ounces. Whoa. And, um, yes. Two pounds. Was, Sebastian, you like 214 pounds now. Good <laughs> gosh. I, my guess to be, I was a bit different. He said that's why his oh. bike has to be a little different. Yes. I always say don't do math in public. And okay. this will be public. So I heard 51. I heard 30. So Sebastian, you're 20 or 21. What are you? Um, um, you it's go. episode 21. Rooster probably oh. knew that, but I didn't know that. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, you know what I'm saying? That <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. And that means it's Miller time. So wow. with all the adults here today, we're going to go ahead and jump into Miller time. That's that point of the show where you grab your favorite beverage. And I'm going to take us back and go to episode 19. I'm going to break a trend here, ladies and gentlemen. This is a Michelob Ultra, 95 calories. Cheers to my friends. Sebastian, what you sipping on? Did Mama, Mama bring you something to the show? Mama forgot to bring the sipping stuff. I should have brought us some sipping stuff. Yeah. Tell well, them, the, tell them your thing though. You don't like what? I don't drink. Well, the he doesn't like to drink. I don't. He doesn't I like to drink. Give him all kind of liquor. He won't try. He'll. The only thing I've ever found he likes is a margarita. I don't. <laughs> eventually, not on race days, <laughs> Especially not on race days, rooster. <laughs> Okay, no, that's fair. Well, just in case it's a non-alcohol show, I brought a, um, another beverage. Maybe a Red Bull? You want to have some Red Bull? I, my my I, brain hurts right now. I don't know like if I'm supposed to run and get a beer or get an energy drink. Uh, suddenly, suddenly, my water is like oh, boring. I, okay, I, well, I mean, I we're drinking water. On those. I lived on those. He's telling you he lived off of Red Bulls because when he was doing his acting, he was... We were doing a show that's four hours long. We're going way off the grid right now. But he was in a major production here in Houston, and it lasts for two weeks in Christmas. And he was rehearsing, and he had to do two shows in one day. So he was drinking Red Bulls to stay awake and keep going. So that's what he's telling y'all. Major production? We'll have to come back to that. That's a that's a yeah. tangent. Maybe we yeah. can come back to the thoroughfare. Where were we? Garvin. Miracle child when you were 30. Can we go even further back than 30? You want me to go further back? Okay. All right. We moved here to Houston when I was three. And I went to Katie Taylor High School. Um, I Both of my parents owned their own company. And what ended up happening is eventually at one at some point, this is the, the sad part of the story, we have mental illness in our family. And my dad actually committed suicide. And then my mom died five years later from kidney failure. So that all happened while I was in college at North Texas. Well, well usually in the show, we, we like get to the dance. But I guess <laughs> I we just, just gonna, in. <laughs> I guess we just going to dance right now. So your father died by suicide and your mom had, you said what? Kidney failure. And this is while you're in college at age 18, okay. to, 18 to 22 years old. Yes. Wow. Do you have siblings? I have one brother and he has, he has bipolar as well. So, yes. Now, when you say bipolar as well, is it, does this mean that your father was diagnosed bipolar? Is well, that the... of course, back then they didn't call it that. But yes, that is what he had as well. It runs okay. in my family. My grandmother had it as well. And it's kind of yeah. interesting that all of them have also are considered genius level. All of them. My grandmother was a musical genius. My dad had his master's in economics. And my brother, he was uh, really big in sports and, you know, did really well throughout. Life. Uh, so uh, until now, uh, but he's, I'm okay. I'm okay. So anyway, but yeah, that's, and it's one of those things that you find out a lot of people that are extremely genius level sometimes get it. And it's harder to diagnose because they're able to cover it up more because they're able to function in life pretty much normal. Well, that I, that was really special how when you started to talk of your brother and your brother right now, Sebastian just picked up on your vibe and said, what did he say? It's OK. Yeah, it's OK. Yeah, that's what he said. It's OK. Wow. What are my mom gets very touchy when it comes to. 
I get very sensitive when it comes to the yeah. family. And so yeah. he is very good with keeping me centered. <laughs> and sometimes, like, I don't know, I don't Sometimes he causes me somewhat of a headache. I'm but... on topic, though, okay? <laughs> Sebastian, you're fitting in right perfect with the Together Michelle podcast. <laughs> Yeah, I like. I think that you said like. I mean, we are ten minutes in, and I mean, ten minutes into PJ, we were still trying to figure out about the purge sound coming out of his laptop, and like <laughs> this was like a. I feel like we jumped in, and I didn't have like a a life jacket on. Like we are. That was that was deep, quick, and I feel like I have many questions. Okay. But I don't know, like. Uh, I'm so. So, so go. <laughs> All right, so going back to the the brother thing, like why is that sensitive now? Because my brother right now is he's in jail, and this pandemic really got to him and was not a healthy thing. So it it's got me real emotional because it's something that I never thought would have happened. So gotcha. So in outside of him and Sebastian. Uh, do you have any other immediate family right in the area? Or? No, my friends are my family. Rooster can attest to this. Like everything that basically, that's why these organizations are so important to me because I meet people that instantly become our family. Right, Sebastian? Uh. Yeah. So um, because they're usually our support system. And that's what makes it so amazing to be a part of Ainsley's Angels. One of the reasons. Yeah, that I mean, that's like Rooster said, whatever, 10 years ago, strangers yesterday, friends today, family tomorrow. Um, I like can vividly remember what I believe was the first time he said that uh, over some Miller time uh, at a beach house. Uh, but there's so many members within the family, right, that have experienced, we'll call it, you know, a tragedy in life, right? Yeah. That the the angels around us like picked us up. I mean, you know, a month ago I lost my dad unexpectedly and the, the amount of people from Ainsley's Angels that I only know from Ainsley's Angels, not like I grew up with, I don't work with, but Ainsley's Angels like reached out cards, texts, flowers, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, help to to pick us up. So it's it's always exciting to hear and humbling and makes everybody happy and smile when they hear, or in some cases see, you know, this happening, that your Ainsley's Angels family is your family, period. Period. Yeah, uh, for yeah. sure. For sure. They mean the world to us. And we meet more and more people the more that we get we get involved, right? Uh, yes. And a lot of his... Um, big, go ahead. Speaking of that, though, I'm... I'm doing this each one thing. But we want to stay on topic. You're so, getting off topic. You're getting off topic. Again. But, but. Bro, I, I, I get off topic too, man. Shiny nickel and bam. Like I, <laughs> he's all he's like, let's talk about the DC marathon. That's what you're saying. That's Bro, what I was about to bring it up. I was about to bring it up, but I uh, I I just am. Maybe say to them how um does this affect you a lot that you, that your uncle's not directly in your life now the same way. Yes, and, and tell them about the blessing we got because of it. That's our blessing that we have. Yeah, and yeah. our dog. That's why we got our dog is because. He no longer could take care of her, so now she is our big blessing, uh, yeah, <laughs> our ninety-pound uh, blessing, right? <laughs> I love the, I love the leave hair all over the place. <laughs> he said that loves to leave hair all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> What's her name? The dog? Hera. Hera. Uh huh. And she like what the is queen. She Pit? She's a Dogo Argentina. A Dogo, D-O-G-O, Argentina. She only comes in white, and they have spots on their skin. Looks like a Dalmatian, like, on, on her belly, but, like, yeah. a pit bull on her back. Yeah. Yeah. 
she's so sweet, though. But she's so sweet, though, he said. And the chicken tell you the pieces, though, too. <laughs> That's not what they want to hear. He said she can tear you to pieces, though, too. She's not like that. <laughs> She's not like that with us um, or with people that come in our house unless she doesn't know them. She will let them know you're not supposed to be here. That is very mm-hmm. true. She's very protective of us. But sometimes when I go to the store, I go places. Sebastian is able to stay here independently. I have a camera that watches him. And I can talk to him back and forth on it. So she's here. So if anything ever happens, he has the protective mode right there next to him because she stays right next to him whenever I leave. So, Sebastian, mom was telling me that you came into the world before your time. What does that mean? All my friends been attested. I'm not, I'm not what you consider normal. You do everything what? The what way? Uh, I'm lying. And sometimes it gets me in the time over there. And I enjoy being the center of attention. <laughs> he said, I enjoy being the center of attention. <laughs> and, uh, so when I say he came early, I mean that he was two months before his time. He's only seven months when I had him. So that's when I mean, 28 weeks is when I had him. And I always say that um, the doctors had told me when he was going to come out that he might not be breathing and all that. And so when he came out, he was screaming and crying and everything. And I was like, I said, when he graduated on his little flyer, I said, he still is the same. He's, you can hear him above everybody else. <laughs> And he's never stopped talking since the day he came out of me. So that's the thing I always say. Everything he can't do with his limbs, I always say he does well with his mouth. <laughs> that is my, that's the thing I always say about him. <laughs> yes, I do. Does, does that tie into this, uh, the production? The, was it a movie? So, um, no, he did. Do you want to tell him what you were in? Uh, uh, I do it. I used to do acting uh, time to time. He used to do acting with Tuts. Time to time. Yeah, time to time. He did Tuts. And I used to do the river too, by the way. So it's a group for special needs kids, but they partner them up with kids that that are typical. And they do different productions. But he got a chance to do uh, Uh, Elf. He got a chance to do Elf right before the pandemic. And, and he had four changes in the production and he basically did background stuff or whatever. Like they pushed him in and, but he was like the finale person at the end of the show that came out and they had him and all this to do. Like he was all lit up and everything it was really cool. Not in the way my mom says I wasn't lit. I wasn't. You were really lit with lights. So there's lights all no, around you. And no, I... The, oh, he's thinking of lit like drinking. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't like... Uh, that is my child. Uh, that's, that's funny. Sometimes you gotta get lit in both ways, Sebastian. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. But, that but not on, not on race day. Not on race day, exactly. <laughs> well, it could be on race day, just need to be after race day. <laughs> there you go. I, there you go. I, like I, I <laughs> do. Uh, I owe being on age, please, I do. Still have a friend of mine. What's your friend's name? He said he owes being on uh, these angels to a friend of his. What's her name? Anna. Anna and who? <clears throat> Anna and Paige. We would not have gotten involved with Amy's Angels if it wasn't for Anna and Paige who are here and a big part of our lives. Um, Paige, I had helped Paige. One of my friends from high school knew her and she was going to send her child to camp. And she was so scared to send Anna to camp. And so her one of my friends from high school called her because she lives in Katy still and um, talked to her and said, call Gary and Gary will tell you what to do. So she called me and she talked to Sebastian and I both and we got her to send Anna to camp 
And then she came back and turned, told us about Angel's Angels. And Sebastian had just actually had surgery on his hip. And we did a race like right after that surgery, like a month after the surgery. Uh, was... He did his first race with the Angels Angels. When was this? Um, what was that? 2000 and I guess it was, uh, six, the... it was either 16 or 17. I can't remember. 16. I think it's 16. Yeah. Nice. 16. And how many races would you say you've done now, Sebastian? Like more than 10, uh, more than 20? More than 20. Yeah, yeah more than 20. Uh, yeah. Actually, I did, I, I did oh, a bit. You did a what? Tell them what you just did. I did a... Uh, I did a... Uh, a triathlon. What? Yeah. And it probably had some of that footage. He said he did a triathlon, and you probably have some of that footage. I did send you some of the pictures from that, but yes. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So, what was your favorite part? The swim, the bike, or the run? The running. Uh, I always enjoyed the no friends. It's all about the friends. He said he enjoyed it all. I don't know if y'all understood him, but he said he enjoyed it all. Um, but especially, he loves the running. And he said that he always enjoys meeting new people, so it was fun just uh, getting a chance to meet all the uh, new people. Uh, I have made several contributions. You've made several contributions to what? To Angel, Angel, by the way. What kind of contributions have you made? Uh, new people have joined us. If you know. Mind you've gotten other people involved with it since you've been involved. Yes. Yeah. So do you like bringing new people yes. to, to, it's to the organization? Fun. Why do you think you like bringing new people? Because I did it. I will that like you always say we always have to be all coming to the advocates. He said, we always have to be our own community advocates. That's why. Yeah. yeah. And, and you you do an amazing job of being an advocate. That's for sure. I, every time I turn around, Sebastian's out there telling people the good word about how we all need to come together and do do things and enjoy yeah. life. You do a good job. Yeah. What do you say? Thank you. Yeah. Sebastian, I even heard one day you got to go to like New York City or Chicago or something. Go, go meet Whoopi Goldberg. Is that true? There you go. You get to go meet like, Whoopi Goldberg. Like, <laughs> I it's either. okay. You can say it. It's exciting. It's exciting. But, oh, man. Did you enjoy that? Yes, I did. But the traveling wasn't very conducive. <laughs> yeah, traveling, traveling, can, traveling can be tough, man. Especially when you're going far distances. Do you have any upcoming trips? Anything you're going to be doing? Oh, what's the upcoming trip you had? Uh, 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 where? Washington D.C. Yeah, Washington D.C. Yeah, uh, actually. Yes, for the military run is what he calls it. The, what is it called? Uh. And then my name is called Marathon. Oh, Yeah, that's right, man. And that's awesome. I, Tell me more about why did you go on The View? Like, what what was that about? I don't mind telling the people. I don't mind at all. He said he doesn't mind because telling them at all. <laughs> why did you go on uh, there? Tell us. It's, it's, a, it's a big... Icon in my world. She's a big icon in his world. Because you like what? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't mean to get into politics here, but... He said he doesn't mean to get into politics here, but your favorite thing is what? I don't know they say about, you know The things that she says about you know who. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what he loves. Oh. 
<laughs> I was hoping they were going to say. He didn't want to get all political, but he's <laughs> saying <laughs> that's his favorite thing. That Whoopi never says his name. That's his favorite thing. He loves it. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say the movie Sister Act. I do. He said, I do love that movie, by the way. <laughs> What's your favorite race been so far, Sebastian? Uh, I don't know that I've been my favorite so far. Maybe he said all of them have been his favorite. Maybe, tell me your favorite thing that you like to go what? Uh, and why do you like to go fast? Well, the had the same experience with Ainsley. A little bit when you get out of your chair, it, it doesn't matter what you have it is. You feel free. He said when you get out of your chair, you feel free. And he said he's sure that Ainsley felt that way too. That's what he was saying. Yeah, yeah man. You got it. You nailed it, Sebastian. You absolutely nailed it. And I hate to bring up your daughter, but I just thought you would. He said he hated to bring her up because he didn't want to, you know, hurt you, yeah. bother you. But he wanted you oh. to know she felt free. Yeah. Oh, no, please, no, no apologies, Sebastian. I love any time we can talk about Ainsley. Try to say her name every single day and remember special times that I, I had with her. So thank you. Yeah. I want to ask your mom a question. We have this podcast a lot, and we have a lot of, of, of caregivers <laughs> that come on to the, to the podcast. And getting the perspective from a caregiver of kind of what life is like and, and, and how they continue to reach deep to get their strength and how they go forward and just are so selfless for others that they love and care for. You're, you're a single mom with a man that you care for every single day. Can you can you give us some perspective, some of your journey along the way? Um, I think that my major thing with Sebastian, and I always thought this, I will be honest, I was, like I said, I had him at 30 with my mom passing away, but my parents being gone, I really wasn't trying to have children. I was on the pill and everything when I got pregnant with him. So he's supposed to be here, obviously. And um, it's the biggest blessing I ever had. God knew something that I didn't know that I was supposed to have. And it slowed me down because I was somebody that worked like 70 hours a week. I was like a crazed woman. Um, mm. And so when I had him, it's like, oh, halt. You got to start a new career. You got to do something to totally different. I actually went to school for fashion. I love everything clothing. And so um, I was really Are big you, into the they can't see my closet, but... <laughs> no, they can't see your closet. <laughs> he but... said I should look from my closet. For all of our folks that view the podcast, they can see that <laughs> fabulous picture behind you with uh, quite the fashion in Easter. What's going on back there, Sebastian? <laughs> Just a little modeling. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so anyway... um. And so when I had him, it was, I think the hardest part was figuring out how to navigate the whole situation because with me not really having any family to help me, um, it was all about me. So when I started seeing how close and connected he was to me, the first time I actually dropped him off at his aunt's house where I could do some work, um, his great aunt, he cried like the entire time I was gone. So then I was like, okay, I got to start researching. So I started researching and I found um, a camp for him to go away for camp. And it started at seven years old. So I started, he started going to away camp. And that's what allowed us to start our distancing from each other and him getting his independence um, away from just being with me and being able to get direction from other people. Why do you say sort of? Uh, uh. Because of my uh, unique ability, sometimes like I need help with yes, things. Because of my unique abilities, sometimes I need help with things. 
He's upset. Ain't but, that, uh, isn't that the truth, Sebastian? All of us have unique abilities, and some of us need a little bit more help in some areas than others, man. So, yeah, how fortunate and lucky are you to have such an amazing, caring mother who wants to go every step with you? Yeah. Uh, uh, but basically, I think that my biggest avenue, and I try to push that when I tell people about Ainsley's Angels and other things, is that I've always kept Sebastian involved. And I think that, honestly, that is the secret to where he is and how he's able to um, navigate life. Because I've always tried to treat him as if he doesn't have special needs. And he knows that he has what? Yeah, no, what is the disorder that you have? Oh, yes, he has cerebral palsy, but I always tell him, don't let the, that stop who you are. And that's how I felt as a mom, too, is like other parents take their kids to their sports and their different activities. His first were therapy. And then he did, you know, got a chance to do a lot of his acting and all that stuff. But that's what I did was push him to keep doing all the things that he could do. And I never wanted him to stop doing those things. If he told me he wanted to do it, I remember I had gave him a party for his 10th birthday and it was a roller skating party. And he's, and I rented out the whole place to make sure that all the kids are in wheelchairs could push or do whatever. And he was like, mom, I want to roller skate. And I was like, okay, I put skates on him. We got out there and we tried to roller skate. Like I don't ever, he's done. I fly. I, which I don't know if people know that's in score, indoor skydiving. He's done that more than one time. I just, anything that he says I want to do, I try to provide the opportunity for him to do it. I try to find it. I research it, whatever it is. And I think that's what's made him be who he is and also not afraid of this world. Like he always wants to try the next biggest thing. There's a lot of truth to that. The idea of it is if we're, if we're isolating ourselves, then we can get really comfortable, kind of think about the idea of a cocoon. You know, if you just stay in the cocoon where everything is comfortable, you can get really, really attached to that cocoon. But by getting out there and getting engaged with your communities and getting engaged with different people and new experiences, that's how we thrive. And Darlene, Darlene talked about that, Joe, back in like episode 14, you know, about the idea that if if, if you're surrounding yourself with, with things that keep your mind moving and your body moving and, and, your, and all of that, that through having healthy experiences, it can lend itself to healthy living. Pretty cool how that works. Yeah, I'm, the cocoon's a great example, for, too, because what, if you get out of that cocoon, like you said, you're a beautiful butterfly. You know, you went in as a worm, right? Came out as a butterfly. So, yeah, breaking out of that cocoon. And then, yeah, the, the keep moving thing. I heard something the other day why people work out. It's significantly more for the mental health than it is the physical health um and how that like if you're you know mentally strong you know a lot of times in turn you can be physically strong but like working out not because i ate a cheeseburger last night and i need to burn off the calories you know working out to the endorphins and the releasing of all that and i was like yeah i realized over the last few weeks getting back into working out more, how much better I feel mentally. Where physically I'm sore from working out, but mentally it's like I, I have to, I'm back in the mindset of I have to work out every day now. This is going to sound like a shameless plug, but it really is not. I learned through my relationship with ASICs that ASICs means of sound mind and of sound body. And so when the mind is in a position to be of soundness, the body can follow um, and vice versa. It's almost a yin yang kind of thing and how that works. And that's what you just described, Joe. And, and Garia, that's what you're speaking to, getting Sebastian out there, getting him to have stimulus to his mind and his body. And that's what I love about running for everyone, not just, you know, the abled athlete, but all athletes. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, when I've seen, I met Sebastian in person, um, taking us back to the Twilight 5K 
I, I think I knew him before that, but I, I really remember that day because we presented him with his own special chair. But at the same time, I got to see, because I pushed him in the race and had conversation with him across the whole 5K, Sebastian, this idea that like you had so much you wanted to say. And you were able to do that because of the freedom that we were having together as we were running around in South Houston. That day, changed everything. Yes, that day changed everything he said. But isn't that what uh, all of the racers say when they run with yeah, you? Yeah, it's the weirdest thing. He said it's the weirdest thing. The girls. <laughs> All of them talk about how you when push I, them to be better. When I meet these other wasters, we talk a little bit of trash. He said, we talk a little bit of trash. <laughs> we all need to laugh and giggle sometimes. We all need to laugh and giggle sometimes, is what he said. <laughs> yeah, man. You, Sebastian, you're right. And, and talking a little trash and having a little joking and the camaraderie, like that is that is what sport is. Of course, the competition that's embedded in it and the idea that every time I run with Sebastian, he always seems to finish a, uh, finish before me. I can't seem to figure that out. But uh, <laughs> I I love wasting not because I ain't my chair nothing like that. It's not because you hate your chair. It's a way I can out my own. It's on sometimes. And I get the help and these angels. Why having so much fun? He gets to help and please angels too while having so much fun. And I do the ability at the wedding. And he does the Abilities Expo every year, he said, too. <laughs> so I see a lot of upcoming racers. I see a lot of... He sees a lot of upcoming racers. Speaking of that, I want to join a attention to one of them. He wants to draw your attention to a new racer. He one of off, them Jaylen. is... <laughs> I don't mean the bag with the bitch. <laughs> I don't want to I'm, I'm pretty much the highest racer out there. Can there. I tell you something? You're, because this is only a two hour podcast, we can't go into too much detail on everything. How about that? Uh, <laughs> uh, we can sum up all your, your excitement and saying, you know, you are an ambassador of inclusion, and you are living the mantra of educating, advocating, and definitely celebrating. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I do. I do it whenever I can. He said he does it whenever he can. The thing I love most about it is the fact that they do get out of their chairs, because everything else that you do you're actually going to still be in your chair if you're someone who is in a wheelchair and you actually get a chance to get into something else. And I feel like that even Sebastian verbally, he does better when he's in his wheelchair and he's running. He does better verbally when he's standing because I have things here that he stands in. So all of those opportunities, you get to see a different light of your person by allowing them to have those opportunities mm -hmm. and see them shine. I've never, ever had the opportunity to look through that lens. The perspective you just painted of the fact that when you come to a race, you get out of your everyday chair and you get into a separate, new, distinct, with a unique purpose chair. Like, And what that does to the mind and to the body, I never stopped to think about that. So thank you. Wow. At home, really, I don't keep him in his wheelchair because to me... This is where he's at all the time. And I would like for him to get the opportunity to see what it's like to sit in a chair like we sit in the chair or sit in. Um, I don't, you know, I don't keep him in his bed. I don't do any of those things. I he has. I'm lucky that I am blessed. I have a machine at home that actually I can push up and down that I use for everything that he does in life. But and Santa, it makes it easier. What? I do like to be lazy. <laughs> 
<laughs> he said, I do like to be lazy. Y'all heard that. I do like to be lazy sometimes. <laughs> and yes, his bed moves. So there's days that he's like, mom, I just want to stay in the bed. And so, but we all do that, right? Uh, yeah. Hey, Sebastian, what, what's your favorite movie, man? You got a favorite movie? Uh, uh, Tell me your favorite type of movie. Uh, I... I then talk to you about movies until the cows come out with something. <laughs> he can talk to you about movies. Oh, I, I, oh, I, oh, I, oh, I heard all those face. words. I bet you but, can tell us about the movies till the cow comes home. That's why I'm asking you because when but, you went for a run, you told me about all kind of movies, and I look forward to the day to introduce you to the other movie buff in my life, Joe. Do you know who else can talk about movies? What's your favorite? But tell uh, what kind of movie uh, you like. Uh, what kind of movie do you like? Uh, I don't like rom coms. No, your favorite is action. action. There we go. No, the rock. the rock is one of his favorites. He said because you like. What's the name of that movie? Fast in the Furious. Fast in the Are you familiar <laughs> with that? Uh, I mean, I am familiar with like the original, you know, and but I feel like I, there's a, probably a dozen now, so I don't know how you can be any more faster and any more furious than <laughs> me. They're entertaining, don't get me wrong. I just don't. He loves when it comes out with more and more. Every time he finishes the movie, yeah. is another one coming out. <laughs> I partial to John Wick. Like John Wick. That. He's partial to John Wick. He I'm, loves- I'm with you. I'm with you on that one, man. I'm really excited for number four. Yeah, he is really excited. Uh, I can't wait. I can I go down to the top of the world. Joe, do you see how excited? Do y'all see how excited his body is? That's the thing is that when he talks, just so y'all know too, is like he uses his entire body. That's how he's able to stay in shape. I wish I had that. I wish I had some of that for myself. Because <laughs> every time he talks, he uses his entire body when he's talking. So that's the reason why you see the head moving. His legs are stretching out, just so y'all know. You can the whole body just goes with whatever word that comes out. Sometimes when I'm when I'm with Sebastian, uh-huh. I, I have sometimes a little bit difficulty understanding exactly what he's trying to tell me. And you and I spoke about this, Garia, and, and you you said something, I'll never forget it. You talked about how we as people, when someone's speaking, we we take in everything they're doing and saying. And so the fact that I couldn't understand him is actually kind of my challenge. Because I'm allowing myself to look at everything he's presenting, his body language, his facial actions, his everything. And that's making it to where I can't focus on the words coming out of his mouth. So it's not that Sebastian has a hard time communicating. I have a hard time knowing how to understand, right? Yeah. Isn't that right, Sebastian? Yeah. Yeah, that was something that we talked about. And it is so true that people don't realize because we're visual people. So we're looking at everything his body's doing. And forgetting about what he's actually saying. And it's, you know, I have different people do, sometimes people will stop me and say, we stop repeating everything he says. Even Rooster's done it to me before. Well, uh, <laughs> but, but it's easier, like I tell him, if you're on the phone, like people that are listening to the podcast, they can probably understand him just fine. I've noticed over the phone, most people understand him very well versus when he's in person. The physical aspect of, of his communication, you know, for, for you, Sebastian, is, you know, the Rooster and I have talked about it before. There's the sender receive model, right? And there's seven steps of that. And certain things of like noise, noise can mean outside noise that's impacting it, but it could also mean, you know, tones and everything from Sebastian as the sender. So Rooster is the receiver trying to block out outside outside noise so he can hear Sebastian's noise to understand him better. Yep, that's true. And I have to learn as a, as a as a receiver. I have to learn how Sebastian uses noises that I may not use, but he uses them to emphasize something or to show his excitement, like he was just doing with the movies. Everything changed in his presentation, in his sender mode, and and ultimately, I think you know that's that's not on Sebastian to explain. <laughs> that's on the receiver to figure that out. So I'm I'm grateful to have that knowledge. So thanks for teaching me that, Garia and Sebastian. Yes, for sure. No, I I think that's the same with any language. Like I always say that when when I've traveled, 
people have said stuff like, oh, I don't speak good English. And it's like, when you listen to them, they sound better than people in the States. Because I think that we don't really, that's something I think as we don't do. We don't take time to really listen because everything is so fast paced. Once you hear somebody doesn't sound the same as you, you just kind of shut them off. You don't mean to, but that's what a lot of people do. And so that's why a lot of times I will repeat when we're out and I don't mean to, but I do it because most people don't take the time. And so I love when people, even though people think they're sometimes I'm like, well, I'm sorry. People will tell me they're like, oh my God, I can understand them. Will you stop repeating? You know? And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, you know, but it's because most people don't take that time, you know, to listen. So that's the reason why I do it. Yeah, it's something that as as a society, and I'm such a culprit of it, through texting, right, we've gotten mm-hmm. into shorthand communication or whatever. And like you saying, like, other countries don't text as much as us you know, they call or, you know, at tea time or whatever it is. So like, they're not using the, the shorthand transferring from this to the vocal. And I mean, I do it terribly, but and it, I think again, as society, it's going from this to emails and official correspondence, if you would. Um, I, I'm definitely guilty of it. It's just, it's crazy to hear other people say that. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. For sure. That was one of the main things that um, when he was in the when I first found out he had cerebral palsy, the doctor, I was like, he can't. Because to me, when I looked at Sebastian, what I knew what CP looked like, in my opinion, didn't look like him. (laughs) So at the time, because then he was still he was able to walk still with I could hold his hand and he could walk when he was little um, up until he was five. Um, I literally could still walk and he could stand up. I could put his clothes on. He would just hold on to my shoulders and all that. And then it was like, as soon as he started having a major growth spurt and we also got him a backlifting pump, that changed his life. Like it, it changed how he moved and everything. But he said, hold on. But he said that to me that as long as Sebastian is able to communicate in this world, he will be able to make it. That is what he told me. And because he told me I need to stop worrying so much about him walking and doing all those things. If he can communicate he can function in this world. And I've always put that in my head. And I also had another friend who had a child who was not, um, who was not verbal and, but she was walking and she told me that same thing. So I think that sometimes that's another thing that I've, a lesson I've learned is that go with whatever your niche is, go with what you're strong at and stop trying to change what you can't change. That's Mm, something. Yeah, profound. Play to your strengths. I love that. And and when you say if you can communicate, you can thrive in this world. I twisted that a little bit. But if you can communicate, you can thrive in this world. It's not about being able to verbally communicate. It's Mm -hmm. about being able to achieve understanding of the receiver. Right. Exactly. 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 Yeah. I mean, it was earlier, like something else you were saying is like when you said listening, like you said, it's not about Sebastian listening. It's about others listening. When you have people who, for example, Anna, um, Paige's daughter, she's nonverbal, but oh my God, I know that she understands everything I'm saying because of her reactions to the things that I'm saying. And I always know, like, you know, the difference when you see, but we don't usually take that time. And I think that that's really important that we take time for that. I think that also goes back to the mental illness part we need to take time for others and look at what they might be going to listen to one another. So I think all those are important for sure. Well done. I'll never know what you know, and I'll never feel what you feel and for all the caretakers out there. But I, as I've said before, I'm just, you know, happy and, and it's an honor to, to be part of the organization and, you know, to, to get to know people like you and Sebastian. Yeah. I always say to me, like, even with that, with what you're saying, like, I always tell people, I don't know what Sebastian feels like. I had one time he was trying out a power chair and this, and I would love for Sebastian to drive a power chair, but because you see how much he moves his body, it's hard for him to work a power chair. So we were trying and this lady that was helping, which was a therapist. She was like, Sebastian, I understand your frustration. And I stopped her and I said, how do you understand this frustration? Do you have cerebral palsy? And she looked at me like, 
And I said, I'm with my son most of the time. And I said, I'd never tell him I understand what he's going through. Because I don't. I, I'm not in his body. I don't understand that. And I think that that's something that I would say huh, that's pretty important is that people, uh, that people, no, I don't even want to use the word kind empathy. Of, huh? What do you want to say? You kind of do. I kind of do, but I don't totally understand. No. And I think that. I mean, I because my, uh, my mom has a Oh, he's going to say, I tore my quad. He's talking about, I tore my quad through this pandemic. And so he told me after I tore my quad, mom, for the first time, you understand a little bit about what I'm going through. That was the first thing he told me, because it, it's true. I, I even, it's happened in 2020, and I'm still struggling with walking right now. Like, I just still haven't got my gait back. But go ahead. So that- Sebastian, I appreciate that, man, um, and the fact that you recognize that for your mom, and, and that's kind of a little bit of empathy. That's your heart trying to reach out to your mom and say, you know what, I know that you'll never necessarily experience my life through everything that I do, but it, but there's some connection point. And I think ultimately that's a lesson that we can all learn is, is trying to not necessarily walk in so-and-so's shoes or really just trying to take the time, like Sebastian has done with you, to, to help others have this perspective. And that's what we're trying to do with the Together We Shall podcast, is to bring about new perspectives and new walks of life. And, you know, because everybody's got so many experiences. And when we take time to make meaning of our stories and to actually listen to one another in a way that is to achieve a higher level of understanding, like we talked about earlier, we can get to a point where we can share our perspectives. So, Sebastian, that's really nice of you to highlight that for your mom. Um, And speaking of that, let me just say this, that that was one of the things in school for him that once, uh, especially in high school, I believe that that was a, hold on, let me finish. I hate being in the I I hate it. Well, let's don't talk about that right now, okay? But I would say that, uh, dude, I still want to pull the string. I got I got to know what it was. Too. What does he hate what does the... special needs class? I don't like him to say that as much because it's it's hard for him because his understanding level uh, is he's been tested no. and he's on his grade level. He's on his understanding level. So it was hard that when you had kids in his class who were still watching Teletubbies, who were in high school, you know, um, for him to interact with. So and that's that, a system thing. That, that means we're just casting one one, one brush of a stroke and saying, if you have a special need, then you're all going to be taught the same way. And, and that's, that's a system it, thing. That's, yeah. And, that's and so guess what? Guess what, Sebastian? I, I, too, would hate to be in the special needs classroom if, indeed, they were not – teaching me at the level in which I'm showing up. That's not fair. Now, granted, hate is a big word. You know, we don't want to use the word hate. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, you just wanted to be around your own peers, people that were where you were and that you could communicate with, correct? Yeah, and I think I don't me that. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, his acting did because in high school they allowed him to act. But what I was going to say is that that what you just said, the system with education is something that I really think I don't know about the states that y'all live in, but I know Texas and Lord, we don't want to get into that. But our person is in a wheelchair here (laughs) and still doesn't get it. But um, with that being said, is it's so important to allow for our kids to be mainstream, be a part of everyday life. Because when we do that, then people are more accepting of us, you know, Um, or have a better understanding or are more open to it. All those words, because that's what happened with him. When he got in, he did a little mainstreaming in middle school. But when he got into high school, he had a teacher that was like, he does not need to be in here and took him and just said, we're going to mainstream him. And it opened the doors like his friends started wanting to they came and got him to go to class. He didn't get the aid to take him anymore. His friends would take him. And I think that the world needs to open up 
that door. And when he went to prom, he went to prom with all able-bodied people. The girls asked him to go to prom. Ultimately, that's inclusion. The idea that we all should be mainstreams in everything we do. And yeah. if we adjust our systems and our programs and our structures and our beliefs to, to embrace this idea, exactly. then suddenly, you know, we're not just throwing a group of people into a room and calling it the special needs classroom. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And and I do believe there are certain situations where Look, it's not going to work for every every special needs person. No, there might not be. But they still need to make a window where it may uh, work for even the ones that you think might not. Uh, because I get that people say teachers and stuff I, like that, that the pressure. Hold on, Sebastian, you know, one at a time. Um, the pressure of a teacher putting all that on the teacher. but that's once again where we put money in education because that was my main thing. Because I feel like Sebastian honestly would be in college right now if the system had not have fought me at every tooth to allow him to have an aide go to class with him. Because they told me I was handicapping him by wanting an aide to go to class with him. That's why. And I started in elementary fighting for him to be mainstream with an aide. But all they saw was him. They didn't, they weren't looking at what he really understood. By the time he got to high school, he had learned all the history that the other kids had maybe had learned from elementary on, you know, that kind of thing. He took economics and all those classes, but he knows all that because him and I talk and because we watch, I make him watch stuff on TV where he's aware of the news, you know, the things that are going on in the world. But it wasn't because they were teaching him that at school. And those are things that I think, you know, we need to change the structure of because it'll make it better for everybody. Because I believe everybody has learning curves, period. I know I did when I was in school. I had a learning curve myself. So I was in um, in the, uh, what do you call it, resource classes um, for my reading. So I know that we all have, you know, our learning curves. That's why I say find the thing that works for your person, your that you have your child because all of us learn and see the world differently. And if you find that niche or that thing, they can blossom. And that's what I feel like I've been able to do with him because his niche obviously is this mouthpiece, right? <laughs> and so it's allowed him to get the opportunity to do a lot of different things because of it. So, yeah. Indeed. I mean, the education system from, top to bottom, bottom to top, definitely has its, you know, its hiccups. I just hate how, like you said, you know, don't want to put that burden on on the teachers. And it stinks that, like, that happens and funding and, you know, you got too many kids in the classroom and, or in this case, not enough, you know, teachers to where you could have potentially split Sebastian's class into two, right, to where they would have been able to to learn more at their level. It just... It's upsetting, you know, and teachers, as we all know, are, are underpaid and it just, you know, thinks that they have to go through a lot of these uh, troubles. So shout out to the teachers out there. When I say burden, I mean burden of they're not giving them enough sources, resources. And I don't mean that burden. It's burden when you're one teacher, even in the special ed classrooms or special needs classrooms, they're taking AIDS away every day. So how can a teacher help out? It doesn't matter where you are in teaching right now. They need more help and to allow for these things to happen and teachers to have a better understanding because that's on a lot of different topics, not even the special, just special needs topic, you know, and we and that opens the door to a lot, too, that I feel like even with with what we have going on, I want inclusion for everybody you know, um, us being, you know, Black. I want that to be an important thing that we make sure that we open the door for minorities, for all those things, for everybody to get that opportunity. And we learn about one another, you know, because that's what I, when I even look at him, I think about that with LGBT community, all those things. I think that we need to all try to do our best to try to learn about one another and have an understanding of, where we are doesn't mean that we have to like rooster said earlier walk in their shoes we're never going to be able to always walk in one another's shoes but 
the understanding or the open mind, open your mind to trying to learn or try to have an understanding of one another will make us all up this all a better place. That's just how I see it. Yeah. Roll the damn credits. <laughs> I mean, there you go, girl. You just nailed it. And and Joe, you're pointing back there. Go, Joe, share with us your new poster up on your wall. What did Einstein say? So, old Albert said, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So, yeah. I mean, like you were just saying, right, don't, don't just learn the facts of all the different communities out there, right? Learn to think about them, and you know you don't have to agree with everybody, but you know it, it's the same thing as being respectful, right? Um, kind of like why Whoopi didn't say his name because she probably would have went on a tangent and said some bad things, right? She said some bad things, but didn't say some bad things, you know. <laughs> and also, too, I think we need to put ourselves like I feel like I've done with Sebastian, put ourselves in situations in that room. are uncomfortable. Yeah, in the room, put yourself in uncomfortable situations. I mean, that's to me is so important, you know, it's, and that's every walk of life. We need to put ourselves in a situation where we're uncomfortable because if we do that, it will be a better place. Absolutely. There's, there's a saying, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And like through many, uh, you know, Ragnar's, you know, that 200 mile relay, like there's that window about Two to four in the morning where, you know, Rooster, we would talk about, you know, don't go internal, like just get comfortable being uncomfortable for these next couple hours. You know, if you have to put your hands in your pockets and walk up a hill backwards, that's fine. But just keep moving. Yeah, keep moving forward. And, and that whole idea of being uncomfortable as you keep moving forward, you, you're you going to get that confidence. You know, you're going to get where you need to be. Um, and Sebastian, by your mother putting you out there in the deep end and saying, go out there, young sir. Now you have blossomed into this man who everywhere you go, you're out there advocating for yourself. You're out there advocating for people who look like you. You're out there advocating for people that look like me to understand the space in which you live. And then you invite me into your space. And you're doing that because you have the confidence that all started with continuing to move forward and being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Oh, we have to be a little uncomfortable. Oh, we have to be a little uncomfortable. Yes. When I, it's always, it can't always be the way we want it to be. We have to be a little uncomfortable. Yeah, man, it can't. You're right. It can't always be the way we want it to be. But, you know, we can do our best to kind of educate people along the way into why it, <laughs> It educates people one of my major things I tried to do that. What does he so many of my friends. The daughter thinks that education is something that he always tries to do with so many of his friends. So many of them. I can't wait till October when you can educate me uh, some more over a margarita. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, margarita. Yes. 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 We turned 21, we did mimosas, and I was, everybody's in the room. Drink, 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 Sebastian. <laughs> did you enjoy it? Oh, uh, God. <laughs> that was the most embarrassing thing. <laughs> he said that was the most embarrassing thing. Oh, And you probably know. I don't, I don't conform to the You don't conform norm. to, I don't conform to the norm, so that's why it's embarrassing. <laughs> no, no, that's fair. No. Sebastian, I was going to ask you for a weekly word as we go further into September here, but like, uh, I don't know, maybe you just nailed it with, what, I don't conform to the norm. Maybe that's your weekly word. That's pretty strong. What do you think? Uh, that's it man that's it garia is there a weekly word maybe you want to you want to offer us uh as we go off yeah. and continue uh between now and marine corps marathon uh we talked about so many things today and i just think my most important thing is just like for us to you know i guess to take time for one another uh, i think that's uh, my uh, most 
important thing. Love one another too. He said, love one another too. So take and time and some love people, one another. Uh, they might be different. They might be different. They might be different, but what? Who cares? But who cares? No, but I love It's like about that person, whoever that is. They just care about their person, whoever it is. Got you, man. Well, that was fun. So funny. I hope everything was okay and great for us today. I, we enjoyed being with them, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. And it. we're so excited to have met you, Joe, because I've I've emailed with you, but I've never gotten a chance to actually see your face in person besides on the podcast, you know. Yeah. So it's nice to actually talk to you. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. Looking so forward to yeah. physically meeting. Yes, exactly. Uh, and you know we love you, Rooster. Thank you. Oh, thank you my thank gosh. You. Yes. Uh, From day one, I think uh, we uh, felt a little kinship with Rooster, didn't we? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I, I got, got enough. Time. He's in charge. <laughs> we're done. This was good. Yeah, we're done here. <laughs> uh, the structure of this building has reached its capacity. Find your people, and if they make you feel sexy, even better.